I'm going to be talking to Martin Lambert, who's a senior research fellow with the Oxford Institute for Energy Studies, about a project that BP recently introduced, uh, the High Side, uh, sorry, High Green Teesside Projects located in uh, the Northern England. Uh, so welcome to the interview, Martin. Thanks very much, Malcolm. It's great to be here. Now, this is a very interesting project because it is BP, the UK super major, is starting with green hydrogen. It already has a blue hydrogen project, with, so they'll be turning natural gas into hydrogen. But this particular one is, is green. Why did uh, uh, BP decide that it would do a green hydrogen project at this point where you know, green is generally considered to be a more expensive form of hydrogen? Um, I think just to pick up one thing, you said BP is starting with green hydrogen. I think I'd say they're kind of adding green hydrogen to their portfolio of projects. I mean, BP, as you say, is a big company. So what they're really doing is I think they're trying out a number of different things to see what works, to get the learning from it. And then based on that, they'll then sort of bring on the next wave of projects after that. So I'd say this green hydrogen project is just part of their overall portfolio. Um, but you're right, it's more expensive, sure. So they're starting out with uh, 60 uh, megawatt E uh, that they hope to have up by 2025. But by 2030, they could have have as much as 500 megawatt E. And I gather this is a fairly large project. Yeah, large is interesting, I think, in the context of hydrogen, uh, because um, it's large compared to what's been done before. I think currently in Europe, the largest project which has been finished is a 10 megawatt project that's at Shell's refinery in Germany. A BP also has one about 20 or 30 megawatts at their refinery in Germany. Um, so if this one gets to 500 megawatts, that would be the biggest one um, in Europe so far, yeah. Um, but that's it's bigger in terms of what's been done before. In terms of the European energy system, it's actually really quite small. Um, so I'm a natural gas person, and often I say that to get to one billion cubic meters of natural gas, which is like sort of a 1,000 megawatt power plant equivalent, you kind of need to have uh, well over 2,000 um, megawatts of hydrogen production. So it's um, bigger than what's been done before, but relatively small in the global energy scene. And it sounds like many of these companies that are getting into hydrogen are starting with blue, which is uh, about one third the cost of, of green and getting on that learning curve. And, as, and then because they expect that as the cost of electrolyzers comes down, as the availability of renewables increases, that then they'll be able to transition to green hydrogen over time. That's right, but it kind of depends which country you're speaking about. So looking at in Europe, blue hydrogen, so with carbon capture and storage, is being talked about particularly in the UK, Netherlands, uh, Norway, maybe Denmark. But in some other countries, um, carbon capture and storage is not very popular at all. And that's an understatement. There's always people are dead against it in places like Germany and Austria. And so in those countries, they're much more focused on green hydrogen from the outset. But from an overall sort of economics and environmental point of view, the blue followed by green approach makes absolute sense, we think, because as you say, it's lower cost but also going for green hydrogen too quickly until the power grid has been decarbonized doesn't really make any sense because you're better off using the renewable power to decarbonize the power grid. So there's kind of a economic and environmental reason to do the blue then green approach. Now, the, um, the BP project is, I'm not sure if it's part of the net zero Teesside power project or, or close by, but uh, can, what can you tell us about the, the Net Zero project? Well, so um, the Net Zero T side has kind of got lumped together. So there's two industrial clusters on the northeast coast of England, uh, Humberside and Teesside. And those have now come together to form the northeast cluster. And the idea of those is that they would capture um, carbon dioxide, not just from blue hydrogen, 
uh, but from a number of industrial centers and power plants up in that part of the UK. And they would then store it offshore the UK in a structure called Endurance, which is a, a structure under the North Sea. And that's one of two, so that Northeast cluster is one of two um, projects being prioritized by the UK government, the other ones in the Northwest of England. So those are two carbon capture and storage projects the kind of the front runners to go ahead quite soon in the UK. Are there significant cost savings and uh, synergies from developing these uh, uh, as clusters? So transporting hydrogen is not cheap. I mean, and certainly not as cheap as transporting natural gas. So that's why we think it makes a lot of sense to do the cluster approach. So if you can find a structure fairly close offshore and you can have a group of industries that all emit carbon dioxide, you can capture the CO2 from them uh, and then you can pipe it offshore. And you have like one operator for the pipeline, the transport and the storage system. That's definitely got some economies of scale over trying to do it standalone. Uh, and then you can sort of, you can then build out from the cluster. So I think the model of starting with industrial cluster and maybe expanding beyond that later, that makes absolute sense. How far advanced is uh, carbon capture utilization and storage in uh, the UK? I mean, we've got a fair amount of that in uh, CCUS in, in Canada and in, in Alberta, uh, where they're pl also planning some additional investments. And the, the experts I've interviewed talk about, you know, this is really important to get on the learning curve because the cost will come down as uh, the operator and the developer get they get expertise and, and get a supply chain, all of those sorts of things. So how far along uh, is uh, CCUS in the UK? Well, so these will be the first CCUS projects in the UK. So it has, it's been talked about in the past. And in fact, the UK government track record on CCUS is not great. Um, so there were some projects who I used to work for Shell for many years. And so some of my colleagues in Shell were working on a power plant project in Scotland. And that was close to final investment decision. And then the UK government um, had a spending cut and they pulled the plug. And that was the second time that's been done. So there's been a number of times when the government has started down the CCUS path and pulled out of it. So currently in Europe, the only um, significant CCS projects are in Norway. So there's um, a couple of gas fields um, off Norway that have CCS going, but for the UK, uh, these would be the first. So, and even looking globally, um, there aren't that many projects, you say a lot in North America. Um, and so there's a big expansion globally of CCS required. And so getting to learn about particular structures definitely is a good idea. Well, Martin, thank you very much for this. Really appreciate your insights. Okay, thank you very much and uh, good to talk to you.